So today we're uh, very happy to have uh, Peter Graham as our colloquium speaker. Uh, Peter is a pioneer in uh, leveraging precision instruments in the search for new physics, both in the context of particle physics and cosmology. So in the context of particle physics, he searches for various types of uh, dark matter um, using uh, advances in uh, atom interferometry, nuclear magnetic resonance, and magnetometry. And for an atom interferometry, it can also be used to search for uh, very low frequency gravitational waves, both on Earth and in space. Uh, so he's proposed uh, several of those experiments uh, called CASPER, dark matter radio, and MAGIS, some of which we'll hear about today, uh, that are currently al uh, are already running. Some of it have set limits already, and others are still in the development phase. Um, Beyond his high precision uh, frontier work, he's also an accomplished theorist and he's proposed uh, notably relaxation, cosmological relaxation mechanisms to um, explain the small values of the Higgs mass and the dark energy. And he's made uh, many other contributions, too, ma too many to, to name, uh, to high energy collider physics and particle astrophysics. Uh, Peter did his undergraduate at Harvard, uh, receiving his bachelor's in 2002. He received his PhD at Stanford in 2007, and then he moved up the hill to Slack uh, for uh, postdoc for one year, and then he moved back down the hill for, for to complete his postdoc and start a, an assistant professorship at Stanford um, in 2010. And he is now associate professor. I'm correct about that. Uh, he's won he's won many awards, um, and notably, most notably, the DOE Early Career Award in 2014 and from the Breakthrough, Breakthrough Prize Foundation, uh, also the New Horizons Prize uh, in physics in 2017. Um, so I'll give the floor to you now, Peter. Uh, again, we're very pleased to have you here. Take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that very nice introduction, Ken. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes? All right. Yes. Um, good. and, and um, uh, also, it's uh, uh, I always had great fun back when I could visit NYU in person. <laughs> Makes me sad that I'm not there right now, but I'm hoping uh, to be able to visit in person sometime soon. I grew up, in fact, in New York City, so I always like going back there. Um, yeah, so uh, as Ken mentioned, I want to um, talk about uh, some of uh, our ideas for um, new kinds of detection, new kinds of detectors and new kinds of uh, experimental techniques for broadly um, learning things about fundamental physics and cosmology interpreted very broadly. Um, and please do just interrupt me anytime with questions. I, I definitely prefer that um, to just me talking, uh, but I, I won't probably see hands on Zoom. I'm not very good at that. So just, just speak up. All right. Um, so uh, as, as Ken kind of mentioned, you know, I think um, uh, some of the open questions that, that motivate us are really um, uh, some of the sort of you know big remaining questions we have about about where our universe came from and what it's made of and stuff. So you know it, it is pretty surprising that the standard model of particle physics and cosmology really does a astoundingly good job at explaining so many of our observations, right? Uh, but yet there's some clear missing pieces um, and uh, uh, that that you know don't at all come in our in our current standard model. Things like the nature of dark matter or or understanding the cosmological constant, dark energy, um, things we, you know, we'd of course like to know about the earliest moments of our universe um, that I think are, you know, uh, uh, have been and remain really deep mysteries. And, and in some sense, the success of the standard model only kind of serves to underline <laughs> how, how uh, surprising and interesting those questions are. Um, and, uh, there's been a, actually a, a big, um, a, a, you know, sort of explosion of, of excitement recently um, uh, among many people in trying to look for new technologies or new new ways, new experimental techniques that could get at some of these uh, questions that could that could really help us probe some of these uh, questions like what is dark matter and dark energy, things like that. Um, and uh, I think. I like to sort of uh, motivate that, explain explain why there has been such an explosion recently with this with this little chart, this little plot. Um, this is about uh, atomic clocks, which I'll actually be talking a little bit about in my talk. By no means the only technology. There's actually many different, really impressive technologies. Uh, I've I've really been blown away by the number of different 
um, amazing technologies people have found that could have application to these particle physics and cosmology questions. But, but this plot sort of says it very nicely. This is the precision here of atomic clocks versus date. Um, and in particular, I'll be talking about these optical atomic clocks, these red dots here. And you can see, you know, uh, that at least with this technology, it is pretty astounding, the rate of progress. I mean, they make something like an order of magnitude progress every few years, uh, an order of magnitude insensitivity. And, and in fact, by now this is out of date, you know, there's some other dot here uh, well below 10 to the minus 18 in precision. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really been um, that, that uh, the field has been realizing recently is that there's a lot of these precision technologies that really offer a lot of new approaches for these sort of small scale experiments, or, or maybe we should just say new types of detectors that are very complementary to things like uh, the particle colliders and particle detectors uh, that we've, we've used before to search for new particles. And one of the things that I've really liked about this field is that it, um, uh, because it involves such different technologies and you know you come up with some idea and try to look for okay what what could be the technique that can probe this i think it really requires uh active collaboration between experimentalists and theorists uh, i know i've certainly benefited uh, tremendously from working with many different fantastic experimentalists um uh and uh, even though i'm a theorist i think you know that that has allowed me to actually um uh, you know learn things about experiment and and hopefully propose experiments that that can actually work um uh and i think that you know in general this uh, this direction has really been taking off i've i've seen many theorists and experimentalists get into this recently and they found many promising directions so I, i'm just going to talk about a few that i've been involved with but it's um i hope i leave you with the impression that there's really a a, a big and growing field out there and I actually think, uh, given sort of the rate of new ideas that, that come out every year, um, that there's probably a lot more uh, good ideas undiscovered. So I would say this is actually a really good time. I, I always like to encourage, especially the younger folks in the audience, um, uh, you know, I think this is a really exciting field to get into. Um, and, and if you're at all interested, you know, um, feel free to talk to me or, uh, or actually Ken, for example, has, has uh, done a lot of work in this. So I, I think there's really a lot of good, maybe even much better ideas out there than we found already. Okay, but but what I want to talk about in my talk is just kind of a couple examples of this. I, I won't possibly be able to summarize the whole field. It's it's wide and very diverse and relies on a, a great deal of different technologies and um, gets at a great deal of different questions. But just a few examples of experiments that I've been involved with um, creating. Uh, I'll start by talking about uh, gravitational wave detection with ultra cold atoms. Um, uh, that's a project we've been actually been ongoing for quite a while now. And as, as Ken said, it's um, exciting for me that it's actually starting to, to be built and happen physically in the real world, not just in our ideas, not just on the blackboard. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you about progress with that. And then also I wanted to uh, jump to a very new idea that um, is so far uh, just kind of starting out, which is uh, looking for dark matter and dark energy, doing direct detection of dark matter and maybe even dark energy with storage rings. Um, and this, if there's time, I'll even mention another idea we had about looking for dark matter with NMR, this uh, experiment we called CASPER, the Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment. Uh, but I did want to say there were just, that's really just a few examples chosen for my own work, uh, simply because that I means I know them and I can talk about them, but that's just actually a lot of great work out there by uh, many different people. Um, and this is just sort of a, a, a taste or an advertisement. Okay, so first, uh, let me talk about our ideas for a new way to look for gravitational waves using atomic technology. Uh, and I should say we, we started this actually uh, a while ago now uh, with my collaborators here, and I'm very indebted, especially to all my collaborators, and especially to Mark Kasovich and Jason Hogan, who are our atomic experimental collaborators, and who are now the ones, of course, doing their, them and their groups doing the hard work to make this happen. And as I'll show you now, actually, I'm, I'm happy to say it's grown into a much larger collaboration. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I probably don't have to motivate why we would want to look for gravitational waves, um, but let me just say, uh, obviously, uh, uh, LIGO is already discovering some fantastic things, and I sort of think of it a little bit like our observations with electromagnetic telescopes, right? Every time, for example, we were able to open a new band of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? x-ray or or microwave obviously or or whatever we learned a ton of new things many many things we didn't expect gravitational waves gives us an entirely new spectrum the gravitational spectrum i think uh it's already clear we're gonna we're gonna really learn a lot about our universe from observing the gravitational spectrum 
And in particular, I think it's very valuable to look in as many bands as possible. I think we'll get different information by looking in different frequency bands of the gravitational spectrum. And for example, um, uh, just one of the many questions that, that we may get some, uh, shed some light on with the gravitational wave observations, gravitational waves are really one of the only or very few ways to directly observe the universe before uh, the time of formation of the CMB. Since, they, since they're so weakly coupled, we can, they could potentially be a probe of what's going on in the very early universe, um, <clears throat> as well as many other things. And here's sort of a, a cartoon sensitivity that I just pulled off of Google um, for the uh, sensitivity of different experiments in the, in the strain of the gravitational wave, how much it's stretching and squeezing space versus the frequency. Um, and, and here's LIGO and the proposed LISA experiment and pulsar timing arrays. But what I wanna focus on for this talk is I would characterize it as uh, there's sort of a gap here in what we call the mid band um, below LIGO, but above LISA and frequency where I think there is a lot of interesting science to be done. Um, and uh, I would like to propose that it's, it's worth at least considering new types of detectors, new kinds of detection technology. Um, and, and I'll talk in particular about uh, an atomic detector that could get us into that um, gap. And uh, since it'll come up later, um, just to say, as you may know, it is challenging, for example, for LIGO to go lower in frequency than maybe about 10 Hertz or so um, uh, since they're on the earth, there's the seismic noise, the shaking of the earth ultimately couples into their uh, mirrors, to their proof masses. Uh, and that, that really gives a, a pretty difficult noise floor at around 10 Hertz or so. And so that's one of the reasons there is this uh, kind of open gap here. So uh, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna, how are we gonna detect gravitational waves? Well, let me kind of very briefly give you my uh, theorist cartoon of what an atom interferometer is. Um, and like I said, feel free to stop me anytime. I'm, I'm skipping a whole lot of details, but if you're curious to know more, please ask. Um, so the idea is you'd start with, uh, time goes up on this diagram, you'd start with some ultra cold cloud of atoms, very dilute cloud of atoms. Uh, and we'll actually put them in free fall, as I'll discuss later, so they'll make a good inertial proof mass. Um, and that all, I'm already skipping several Nobel prizes because you need them to get them ultra cold and trapped and all that. Um, uh, but uh, then uh, you would use laser pulse. We, we would use laser pulses to coherently split each atom's wave function in two and separate the two halves of the wave function. So each atom has these two halves, which take these two paths here. Uh, and then recombine the two halves of the wave function again with these uh, laser pulses and uh, measure the phase difference between the two halves of the atom's wave function that's picked up going along these two paths at these final output ports here. Um, okay, so, so you know, I, I'm skipping a lot of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> really amazing and beautiful work by the atomic physics community that could make this actually possible. Um, but that's the basic tool, okay? This is very similar to how an atomic clock would work, for example. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to look for gravitational waves? So here's my sort of cartoon of what a gravitational wave detector um, uh, could look like. <clears throat> I have, let's say, two inertial test masses. We want them to just be free floating, ideally only acted on by gravity, right? And then I have uh, maybe like a laser or something going across the baseline here and a really good clock to time the distance or the time uh, between these two proof masses. And of course, if a gravitational wave goes through, then the distance between these proof masses oscillates. And I can read that out as a, a shift to the timing. And I would say in this kind of very crude analogy or cartoon, that's roughly uh, how LIGO works, that the mirrors, of course, are their inertial test masses. And they work very hard to isolate them from the environment. And uh, the laser goes over the baseline. And, and if you'll permit me to sort of stretch the analogy, the second arm is kind of like the good clock, right? Uh, even a single arm of LIGO would have a gravitational wave signal in it, but uh, there would just be, too, for example, too much noise on a laser to, to possibly be able to see it. You need a reference. You need something to, if you like, stabilize that laser or something to compare against. And that would be provided by the second arm here. <clears throat> All right, so I wanna say this analogy in order to describe um, our idea, our setup for how we're gonna look for gravitational waves, because uh, it's, it's a little bit different, but still falls into the same pattern. So we would have um, actually two clouds of atoms, one on either end of a long laser baseline. Um, and just to be clear, each of these 
clouds of atoms, I mean I'm running an atom interferometer at each end, so two atom interferometers, one on each end of a long laser baseline, and of course uh, we want the, the laser traveling between them because it's the laser that's most easily able to go over very long distances, and you want a very long distance if you want to maximize the very small signal of a gravitational wave. Um, and so even though it's the atoms that are actually doing the interfering, we're actually splitting and recombining each atom's wave function over a short distance here at the end of the baseline, uh, I, you should think of the atoms as being the inertial test masses. They're like the mirrors of LIGO. Even though in LIGO it's the laser that's doing the interfering, you sort of, in your mind, don't replace the laser with the atoms. <laughs> replace the mirrors with the atoms. And this is a, actually a very important point, and for a very important reason. This is kind of one of the key uh, uh, points of our design. The atoms make excellent inertial proof masses. Um, there, you know, atoms have rigid uh, uh, internal levels, right? You, you don't, can't just get tiny little perturbations on top of them. I mean, you could maybe excite a whole level, but that's quite a big excitation. Uh, they don't just get charged up. <laughs> they don't get, pick up small amounts of charge. Um, they don't get struck by background gas. This is a very dilute cloud. So there's a, I mean, that's a, there's a long story there. And I, uh, I just went over it very quickly, gave it a very brief summary, but, but uh, turns out the atoms actually make excellent inertial proof masses. Um, uh, we'll still use the laser to go over the baseline, but then we can also do something different in our design, which is also use the atoms as clocks. So you should also essentially think of these atom interferometers as acting like atomic clocks, and they're sort of timing the, the light travel time across the baseline, okay? Um, and by doing this sort of double duty here, that means we only need a single arm for our interfer. We only need a single baseline to detect gravitational waves and uh, have a differential measurement that reduces the noise. And I should say, you don't have to do it this way. Um, uh, I've had many productive discussions with other people who had other ideas. In particular, I want to call it this, this group here, which proposed what I would say is maybe sort of a hybrid of the two approaches. They proposed using the atoms as clocks, um, since we make really excellent atomic clocks, but, but still using um, uh, macroscopic proof masses, essentially. Uh, and that's also a really interesting idea, I think. Um, but for our approach, we're going to go with, with this sort of dual use of the atoms. We think that uh, if you if you do the trades, that could have advantages. Um, all right. So how do we use the? And and please do feel free to interrupt me at any time with uh, questions or objections. Uh, uh, how do we use this idea to go actually designing our what we call the midband atomic gravitational wave interferometric sensor or MAGIS, uh, designing a gravity wave detector? So here's uh, something actually a little closer to the real pulse sequence we use. Actually, don't, don't look at it or don't worry too much about the details. Um, I, I just wanted to say it wasn't quite the simple atom interferometer I presented on the first slide. It's a more complicated sequence of laser pulses. But what it's essentially doing, OK, and, and I should say we're, we're, we're going to use some atomic clock atom, uh, like, for example, probably strontium in the first iterations, and drive uh, the so-called clock transition with these lasers. Uh, we're the I, our idea here, our design is to set up this atom interferometer to kind of work as a hybrid clock accelerometer. Okay. Um, so what that means is, first of all, we're using essentially the same technology as the optical atomic clocks. So it's by now very well um, uh, practiced, very well fleshed out by by decades of work uh, by the huge clock community, uh, which is fantastic. So we're definitely leveraging all of that. Um, and what's roughly going on here, you can see these, these little black dots are the two uh, clouds of ultra cold atoms. These, these atoms are being split, their wave function split and recombined. And you have this long laser baseline between them. What's roughly going on, you can see, is when the laser passes the first atomic clock, it's, it like starts it off. When it hits the next atomic clock, uh, it stops it, and you get a good measurement of the timing across the baseline. Um, but in fact, also, they're not, they're not actually being run just as atomic clocks. In fact, they're also run as accelerometers, basically meaning I'm using the atom as a good inertial proof mass as well. So I can um, uh, remove uh, any, for example, seismic noise coming in through, through coupling of the laser. You know, laser is a macroscopic object which sits on the ground. It's very hard to completely isolate it from all sorts of sources of noise. But that doesn't matter at all for our approach. That's kind of one of the key points of our approach. Um, that by running these things as accelerometers, uh, if you like sort of the second time derivative of the light travel time across the baseline, um, uh, we're actually just measuring the motion of one of these clouds of atoms relative to the other. And each one, as I told you, is a really good inertial proof mass. In particular, now you can see one key point of this, which is that I told you the atoms are in free fall. 
Well, that means they're completely decoupled from the shaking of the earth, at least seismic, you know, the, the seismic noise that was coupled into LIGO's mirrors through their supports and stuff. Um, we've just dropped our atoms, so they don't have any of that seismic noise. Um, uh, the, and by taking this differential measurement between the two clouds, we remove any of the shaking that comes in through the lasers or the other macroscopic objects in the experiment. So already that's what's gonna allow us to even possibly think about going below that seismic floor that LIGO has, even in detectors on the earth. Um, okay, uh, so that's sort of the basic um, idea a basic sort of cartoon of the, of the experiment. Uh, now let me kind of skip to some recent results because I've been I've been this we we started with this idea some years ago, and at first it was just an idea, <laughs> and and we knew there was a lot of things that needed to be demonstrated to get the precision you actually need to see gravitational waves. We still had to push the atomic technology several orders of magnitude beyond where it was at the time when we started this. Um, so here's a picture of this uh, 10 meter drop tower, uh, which is going into a pit in the basement of the physics building at Stanford. Uh, this is, um, uh, I should say, work by the experimental groups of Mark Kasovich and Jason Hogan. And of course, first thing to say, you need such a long tower because I wanted the atoms in free fall. That was pretty crucial. I didn't want to be grabbing them. I didn't want to be holding them or I reintroduce all this noise that is so uh, deadly for a gravitational wave detector, especially at low frequencies. Um, so, but I want as much uh, time for the measurement as possible, uh, meaning I need, a, I need a, a lot of free fall distance for them to go. And this 10 meter tower gives us about a second or so of free fall drop time. Uh, which is good for looking for waves you'll note in around the one hertz band, which is where we want to be. So when we started this, we knew that there were some key pieces of the technology we needed to demonstrate before knowing if this would really be a viable approach. There were actually, I mean, so I'm going to gloss over a whole lot of important experimental uh, issues here, <laughs> play my theorist card, and just say, you know, pick out a, a couple of crucial ones. The first was atom cooling. We have to make these uh, ultra cold clouds of atoms and we knew at the time they were down to about nano Kelvin temperatures. That was about the world record. We needed to go. We knew you can calculate that in order to um, reduce the backgrounds as much as we want to, we really needed uh, uh, very cold atoms in the tens of pico Kelvin, two orders of magnitude or so beyond the current world record. Um, excitingly for me, and, and at the time uh, we said, boy, that sounds pretty hard, but our experimental colleagues said, no, they think they can do it. Um, and, and excitingly for me, they, they, uh, they, they did it. They proved they could. Um, this is uh, real data here. This is a picture of the atom cloud remaining uh, very small, um, uh, proving that it has a very low temperature. And in fact, if you translate this to a temperature, it translates to about 50 people Kelvin or so, which at least at the time was the world record for coldest spot um, uh, here, in, here in the uh, drop tower here in the physics building. Um, so that was crucial, and that was really the level that we needed. We, we needed to get this atomic cooling to in order to possibly be able to, in order to run the gravitational wave detector. Another key, key piece, so there's a lot of key pieces of technology. I'm just picking out two, but another key piece of it is, you may actually, let me just go back briefly. You may remember here on this slide, you can see that the phase shift comes, the phase difference comes because the atom's wave function takes these two paths. You can probably believe that the more I can separate these two paths, the bigger my signal, right? I mean, if they're on top of each other, there's no signal at all, of course. Um, so how far you can spatially separate the, the two halves of the atom's wave function at this maximal separation here, that's a proxy, if you like, for how sensitive your detector is going to be. Um, and when we started this, we knew we weren't where we needed to be yet. Um, but really excitingly, uh, they've, they've demonstrated it now or, or essentially gotten there. Uh, the, at the time, the, the farthest apart people could pull the two halves of the atom's wave function was maybe millimeter or so, or even a little less. Uh, in this, in this uh, 10 meter tower here, uh, when the midway through the, through the interferometer, when the two halves of the atom's wave function are maximally far apart, here is a picture. Actually, this is a composite image stitched together, but this is real data of what you get. Um, it's a little hard to see, but these big spikes at the end are the two halves of the atom's wave function. Uh, so this is showing you the atom really was in two places, and we can verify that it's still coherent because if you don't take this picture, you can get, get an interference pattern. If you do take the picture, of course, you do not get interference. Um, uh, and sort of amazingly, incredibly, uh, sort, of, sort of still blows my mind, they got these two halves of the atom's wave function to be about half a meter apart. So, so a very macroscopic quantum superposition, by far the most macroscopic, uh, I believe, by far the record for, um, for matter, for atoms. Peter, Peter. Um, 
Can I please? For one yeah. Just Jump a naive, naive theorist question. I mean, you mentioned that you want them to be in free fall because if you're holding them in place, then you reintroduce sources of noise. But when, what about the beam splitter or if there's more than one atom timing and releasing them? Doesn't that just bring back the noise? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I glossed over that, but actually that took us several years to solve. <laughs> uh, there, were, there were several years at the beginning where I thought, we all thought that actually the beam splitter would reintroduce some amount of that noise. It, you won something by doing this cancellation with our with our original scheme, in fact, um, but it was nowhere near perfect. And, and you still needed to do a lot of vibration isolation, things like that. Um, what, what can I say? So it's a great question you're asking. The answer gets a little technical. What can I say? We, that's why I include this picture here. Okay, and that was kind of the whole point of, of this paper, which came several years after our first paper. I, I could I could I could walk you through it maybe maybe afterwards or offline or something but the basic idea was we converted we changed actually totally the type of atom we're using if if you were noticing you may have noticed that uh, we started with rubidium a lot of those results were in rubidium and now we're moving to a clock atom like strontium the idea was actually to get closer to an atomic clock so that what's actually happening is um, the here's this first laser pulse that goes across the baseline and it kind of think of it as the starting gun it starts both atomic clocks. And then when the next laser pulse comes across, you get a measurement of round trip light travel time. But you really are only using when the laser crossed the atom um, to start and stop the clock and nothing about the laser's uh, um, frequency or phase itself being well-defined. You're, you're really using the clock shift itself. Um, and so what that means is any jittering of the laser, anything like that, so, so seismic noise on the laser or just frequency noise in the laser itself, all that is sort of the same thing. Um, uh, that changes, um, for example, when your pulse is emitted, but the clock doesn't even start till it's hit by the, the atom doesn't start ticking, if you like, until it's hit by the laser anyway. So what you really only care about is that this place in the middle where the laser is traveling between the two atoms, that what's, that's where it needs to be pristine. So if I had too much wind or something in there, so we'll be doing this in hard vacuum, of course, but if, if you didn't do it in good enough vacuum, you could have some index of refraction that was varying, that would mess with you. But actual jitters outside where it hits the macroscopic masses, either the mirror or the laser, um, those are nicely canceled. Um, that sort of answers your question. I mean, that was a quick, like I said, we actually did. <laughs> I don't want to brush it off. We thought about it a long time and it wasn't obvious. No, thanks. That, that helps. Thanks. Good. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an absolutely key question for sure. <laughs> um, and in fact, very important terrestrially. So I'm, we'll, we'll start with terrestrial, as you'll see. But then later, I'll show you projections even for a satellite based experiment. It becomes even that much more important. And in fact, that's one I'm of the confused key things. About a I'm sorry. Please, yes. I'm confused about a related point. Do they, do I, should I think of beams falling together and, and somehow, I, mean, I may be confusing it with some of the early ideas that were Lisa-like, but is this all happening inside one of these thin packets? Where's the uh, second good. atom? Well, good, good. They, they're really, think of, um, up here, I'm going to imagine this is like, for, for example, imagine that's this is the 10 meter tube I just showed you at Stanford. We would actually run one small atom interferometer up here. It, the atom would separate, also be in free fall during that time, and another small one down here. Um, uh, and only the laser would go between them, and, and they would be simultaneous. So we have two going on, run with simultaneous laser pulses. And that's actually key. It's got to be the same laser pulses, or you don't do this crucial noise removing that I was just talking about. Yeah. So it's exactly, it's that differential measurement between the two atoms that is the only thing that can remove all that nasty uh, noise. <laughs> Was that what you were asking? Was that the question? No, no that's, thank you. Excellent, good. Um, okay, so they've demonstrated these two key pieces in this, in this test facility here. They've demonstrated other things too, um, which make us think that right now we've sort of really got all the pieces, if you like, or many of the pieces, and we sort of wanna try putting them together to make a, a gravitational wave, a real gravitational wave detector. And of course, this 10 meters, um, uh, while much bigger than the previous atom interferometers, uh, is still not big enough to go looking for gravitational waves. So we have to go bigger. <laughs> uh, so we've started going bigger. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to be able to tell you that we started a, a collaboration that we call Magus 100 to build this um, 100 meter uh, strontium uh, drop tower here. It'll be located uh, at Fermilab. Uh, actually, this is an access shaft here to the neutrino beam. Uh, and, and we only need a small piece of this access shaft. It, it runs vertically 100 meters. Um, so they were happy to uh, lend it to us. Um, uh, and the idea will be the same. We'll have these ultra-cold strontium atom sources. Um, here you see uh, 
actually a picture of one of them in Jason Hogan's lab at Stanford. Um, uh, and we'll be running again atom interferometers, for example, the top and bottom of this. Um, there's actually some technical reasons we'll want to run some in the middle as well, but, but just to, it would work just to run them at the top and bottom um, and look for the gravitational wave signal. Um, and actually, um, uh, so it's, it's very exciting to me. This is, this is happening. This is starting now. We've started building. They've started constructing the atom sources and the light source, and they're working on um, constructing this tube, uh, the vacuum chamber and the, uh, the magnetic shielding and everything we need. Um, and um, uh, I should say, though, this is um, we, we still view this as a demonstrator. I view this maybe analogous a little bit to the 40 meter interferometer that LIGO had at Cal has at Caltech. Uh, it's a stepping stone to show we, we ultimately want to get to the sort of kilometer scale. That's what we think could make a good uh, terrestrial detector. Or, and also, of course, we want to demonstrate technology for a potential future satellite based detector. Um, but we thought before going to the kilometer scale, uh, uh, proving that we know what we're doing and, and solving problems at the 100 meter scale was probably very valuable. Um, and I think we're learning a lot from that. Um, so it's exciting that this is funded and this is happening now. And we think over the next uh, four to five years, we'll have this um, fully constructed, hopefully, and taking data. Um, and I wanted to point out that while we, we suspect it won't have the sensitivity to see gravitational waves that you need to go bigger, of course, you never know. I mean, this is looking in a new band, this band below LIGO. So it's, it's possible there are some sources there that, that we haven't thought of. Um, it will right away, though, um, be a direct dark matter detector, which is kind of neat um, and, and certainly not something we thought of when we first started this project. But actually, this is um, a joint work with Ken uh, here. Um, uh, we realized that this kind of very sensitive uh, detector can also look for ultralight, sort of axion-like dark matter um, through the oscillation it causes to the atom's energy levels. And I, I won't say any more about that right now, and, unless you're interested, but I, I will get later in this talk to a brief discussion of ultralight dark matter and how it would work. And that will hopefully make that a little more clear. Uh, but anyway, that was new work that we realized after we had, had uh, you know, started thinking about all these experiments. Um, so that was pretty exciting to me. That could also be a dark matter detector. And I just wanted to say it's um, it's grown a lot. So this is our current collaboration list. Actually, every time I give this talk, this collaboration list is about doubled. Uh, it's, it's growing fast right now because we're starting just starting to build. Um, and uh, for me, actually, one of the, so here's again some pictures. These are actually, you can see the ultra cold strontium atoms right there in the, in the trap in Jason's lab. And these are some pictures of the strontium sources that are constructed at Stanford. For me, actually, one of the really interesting sort of uh, lessons or something or, or takeaways from this, um, this was actually a sort of, to me, a, a fascinating and, and sort of surprising collaboration between atomic experimentalists, of course, who are, who are the ones who have built up this atomic clock type technology, but also between what you might call the more traditional particle physics experiments at Fermilab, for example, or SLAC. Um, and it was actually very valuable, or it has, is, is very valuable, because um, if you want to build you know, a, a 100 meter long, or ultimately want to get to a kilometer long vacuum system, magnetic shielding, control of the magnetic environment, control of everything, <laughs> um, that's you know the, the, the particle physics people are the ones who got good at that, right? <laughs> you need these kilometer long, many kilometer long accelerator tubes. We need something relatively similar. Um, so actually leveraging a lot of the existing expertise um, at Fermilab and other places has been really valuable um, for this. So it's actually a fascinating partnership that I sort of grew naturally, I hadn't thought of at first. Um, and, and part of why we've attracted many people to come join the collaboration. So if you're interested, now's a good time to join. <laughs> Send me an email. Um, OK, so let me sort of jump over all sorts of other. I mean, there's lots of crucial questions about backgrounds and things, which I'm happy to talk about. But, but in the interest of time, let me jump in and project um, uh, if or when we do build these bigger, the, the either kilometer scale terrestrial detectors or the satellite based detector, what kind of gravitational wave strain sensitivity could we get here in strain per hertz versus frequency? And you can see I have the design sensitivities for LIGO and LISA. And, and we think we can probe the mid band here. Um, this Magus 4K, that's the terrestrial detector, this solid black line. Um, although to be clear, there's an issue that I, uh, uh, there is one really important issue that I can't fail to mention. Um, I said these atoms are well isolated from seismic noise, which is true. They're not attached by, by cables or anything to the ground. You know, LIGO also could isolate from seismic noise, right? If they, if they cut the cables or something, it would be the same. Although mirrors are very expensive, <laughs> you can only do that once. Um, but for, for either LIGO or atoms, there's no avoiding gravity, right? There's no screening gravity. And in fact, it turns out this, what's called uh, gravity gradient noise, um, couples the, the shaking of the earth it couples just through Newtonian gravity, you know, through the one over R squared law um, to your proof mass, whatever it is. 
Uh, and it's a pretty universal thing that's difficult to get around on the Earth. Um, here's a, I have this dash because this is a guess at a calculation in the Homestake Mine site, which is where we're considering. We went a little bit on that because we go deep naturally with this experiment. We go underground where there's somewhat less gravity gradient noise. And, and actually we have some other kind of fun ideas that we're exploring right now that I'm, I'm pretty excited about that may help reduce that noise. But that's always gonna be with us and that's gonna cut us off at low frequencies um, somewhere around here or so on the earth. And that's part of why you'd still wanna consider going to space um, because you would still have some of this noise from the shaking of the earth there. Okay, um, and then just very briefly, I, I'll, I think I'll skip, what time is it? Yeah, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip really talking too much about the science of the midband, although actually that's mainly what I've been thinking about um, in the past uh, year or two. I think there's a lot of interesting science in the midband that you can do. Um, uh, I'll just plot some of the sources here. So these were the early LIGO black holes, for example, and a neutron star binary. You can see that uh, uh, mid-band may be the perfect place to see, for example, white dwarf mergers, which you really can't see in any other band. You need to go out to about 20 megaparsecs, it's estimated, um, uh, uh, to get about one white dwarf merger per year. And you can see that you really want to be in the mid-band to see that, for example. Um, so just to say, I think there's a lot of interesting science in the mid-band. Actually, one thing that we um, we pointed out recently, um, I think people hadn't been thinking a lot about the mid-band. So there's a lot that, that still hadn't been figured out or, or said yet about gravitational waves in the mid-band. We realized that even a single arm detector like this could actually do excellent uh, sky localization, had, would have excellent angular resolution on, on localizing these binary sources. Uh, in fact, often sub-degree if you can even see the source at all um, for a, a cool story I could tell you later if you're interested. Um, uh, and that, for example, could allow you to accurately predict the merger time and location on the sky so the electromagnetic telescopes would have time to turn and observe mergers as they're happening and things like that. Um, and let me just skip forward, I think, here. There we go. To sort of summarize, um, uh, I think that combining information on the, from the mid-band with the information in the other uh, uh, frequency bands, in LIGO and LISA, for example, really is very valuable and gives you a lot of information. You learn a lot um, from, from having these different bands in the gravitational spectrum. As I said, in the mid-band, for example, you get excellent angular resolution, uh, which may allow telescopes to observe the event. And also, uh, uh, something I've been playing around with recently may really improve your ability to do these standard siren measurements for cosmology if you had a mid-band detector. By the way, this is not specific to atoms. This applies to any mid-band detector. Um, uh, this would potentially allow you to really improve your measurements from standard sirens of things like the dark energy equation of state and Hubble and things like that. And I think you would, as I said, you would learn many more things, including, for example, um, a possible, you know, more speculative, but, but would be really exciting to see, um, possible sources of gravitational waves from the really early universe, like phase transitions, reheating, cosmic strings, et cetera. And I suspect, I mean, the more I think about the mid-band, the more it seems there's new things that haven't been, been thought of yet that we can, we can look for in the mid-band. So I, I suspect there's uh, lots more signals that we haven't thought about yet. And that's something I'm actively thinking about right now. But I think sort of no matter what, observing gravitational waves is just going to be a huge part of the future for astrophysics and cosmology. And I think it's really valuable to observe in um, as many bands as possible. So that's really my motivation here with um, looking for this, thinking about this new kind of detector. Okay, so with that, I was going to transition. Maybe I should pause for a second and see if anyone has any other questions about the gravitational wave story. Um, <clears throat> but if not, I was going to transmission and, and just talk for the rest of the talk a little bit about some of our ideas for new experiments to look for dark matter and dark energy. Um, and this might at first feel a little different, although, as I said, there is some connection even with looking for gravitational waves. Uh, uh, very roughly, they, they're both sort of similar signals, as I'll try to point out. Okay, so... I, oh, please, yeah. I just want to make sure I understand. So the signal you see is that you have these atom interferometers, and like you send a pulse, and then you recombine them, and the time between the two pulses um, tells you, gives you a phase shift in the atoms, and see so their position changes. That's right. That's right. So you can think of them as atomic clocks. We, we actually do something a little more complicated, but roughly think about it as, okay, I'm sending these laser pulses across the baseline, and each atom on each side of the baseline is a little clock that's ticking. Once the first laser hits, it starts ticking, and when the second laser comes back across, it stops it. And you can see if I subtract the time measured by the one clock and the other clock, if I shoot the laser first right to left and then left to right, we, we call it the bing-bang sequence for some reason. Um, uh, if I do it like that, then I subtract the time difference measured by the two clocks 
a, 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 literally, I just actually measure the phase of the atom in the, on the one side and the phase of the atom on the other side and subtract those two. Um, I get a measurement of how long it took the laser to travel across the baseline and back. Um, uh, so, so literally, that's the measurement. I, I do this, this pulsing, sort of like starting and stopping the atomic clock with the laser pulses. And then I, I read the phase out of each atom interferometer and subtract. Um, what, was that the question you were asking? Is that yeah. So, so if, if the time change, if the distance changes between the time you send the two pulses, that's the signal. It, exactly, that's right. Yeah, and in fact, I should have said, of course, the DC value, like on average, that'll basically be the same distance every time. Uh, uh, and at even lower frequencies, that'll fluctuate because you know the tube heats up and the thing expands and gets a little farther apart. Blah blah. blah. But we're going to look around the one hertz frequency, and we've carefully estimated actually all things like the tube heating and and uh, index refraction changes and stuff in the, along the tube. Um, there exactly, we're just asking, okay, in the one hertz band, do we see this time difference, this phase difference between two atoms oscillating? Exactly. And so it doesn't use this weird thing like all bosons have the same wave function. Like you're not sending the wave function across, you're just sending. No, very good. Yeah, thank you, actually. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, and, and for some reason, I, people who talk about this sometimes, I think, say it in a confusing manner, but no, exactly. This is treating all atoms are acting completely independently. Um, we, we try to use as many atoms as possible in our experiment because then you get statistics, but you could just run a single atom through it. <laughs> that would be fine. And that would have your same signal and everything. Exactly. So they're just all doing the same thing sort of next to each other since they're bosons or whatever, but uh, they don't even have to be, but um, uh, absolutely. They're... Now, one of the ways you could hope to improve this um, would by be doing sort of uh, uh, some squeezing, if you like, of the atoms. That would be getting some correlations between their wave functions, and that has the possibility to really improve the statistics. Um, that's one of the active things we're working on now to, to try to make progress and get ever better sensitivity. Uh, but I won't, but that's, let me not say more about that right now unless, <laughs> unless someone's interested. Good. Did that, did that answer the question? Or? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on this before I go on? All right. So <clears throat> dark matter and dark energy. So Dark matter, obviously, nature of dark matter is a huge outstanding mystery. And, and while there's some popular candidates like the heavier WIMPs or the lighter axions, in fact, we really don't know what dark matter is. And its, it's mass even has this gigantic range, of, you know, many, many orders of magnitude where um, uh, the dark matter could be anywhere in this, in this range. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on the lower um, part of this range for, for the rest of this talk. Excitingly, I would say that there's been really a lot of um, new ideas by a lot of different people. And I, I think we're starting to figure out how to cover uh, most of this range or many different parts of this range with, with many different kinds of experiments. If we're thinking about direct detection, I would kind of roughly divide it in two, this range. Um, at around this mass, uh, if you look at the local energy density in dark matter, you can see, you can, you can check that, of course, when the mass is heavy, it's you know like your standard picture of a wimp. There's just one little particle and a whole lot of space around it. And then there's another wimp you know, a few centimeters away or something. But when the mass gets very light, the de Broglie wavelength of the dark matter particle actually becomes quite large. And they start to overlap. right? And of course, the lighter the dark matter particle is, the more dark matter you need to make up a fixed energy density, um, uh, which means that uh, when the mass gets below about this, there's you start to have high phase space occupancy. You start to have much more than one particle per de Broglie wavelength cube okay? locally here. And I would say that has some ramifications for detection. So for example, up here in the high, heavy mass region, uh, we've seen right that these sort of uh, traditional particle detector type technologies, where you're essentially looking for single hard particle scattering, right? At some high angle, dark matter comes in and let's say bounces off a nucleus or something and, and leaves some energy and makes some light or ionization or whatever. Um, that's, your, that's your signal. And those technologies have been very valuable. But down here in the lighter mass range, I'd say you really want different kinds of detectors. Here, uh, I would describe the, I mean, this is sort of hand waving, uh, you know, um, but I would describe the dark matter as being more field like, or sometimes people say wave like. Obviously, we all know waves and particles, same thing, but, but I think it helps for thinking about how to look for it. In particular, um, you, while these really light mass objects can't leave a whole lot of energy one by one, hit by hit in a detector, you can look for the coherent effects of the entire field together. And in fact, I would say that's really what we're doing with the gravitational wave detector, right? Each, each you know, particle, each graviton in the gravitational wave, we're not going to see that, <laughs> right? 
Um, but, uh, and they're, you know, certainly weakly coupled like this dark matter will be, but when you put all the effects together, when you look for the coherent effect this whole wave, then maybe we have a chance. <laughs> To kind of describe that in, in pictures, you know, here's if this is your picture of heavy particle dark matter, I would say this, this much ultra light dark matter, think of it more like a field. Maybe it's a vector field, some electric field stretching around the galaxy, or you know, maybe it's a, a scalar field, right? So it just has some value at each point in space, and then and then um, uh, it's like a wave, it'll oscillate in time. And that's essentially the signal you're looking for. Uh, and in particular, um, you can see from the rules of quantum field theory that this uh, field, since it's cold, since it's non-relativistic, has to oscillate at roughly a frequency given by its mass, okay? So that's essentially the signal you're looking for. Just like with the gravitational wave detector, you're looking for some background field coming through your detector, oscillating at some very fixed frequency, okay? Of course, we don't know what it is, so we have to search over this big mass range I just showed you on the previous slide. But the exciting thing is we can design a lot of different detectors over that mass to, to cover that mass range. And I think we're, we've really now the sort of, we, the community together, all, all the people's ideas together have really started to come up with really good ideas to cover all the different chunks of that mass range, um, which I think is, is very exciting. And was not the case even just a few years ago. Um, <laughs> when, when, when we started this field, there was very little of that mass range in fact that you could cover. And in fact, if you took that mass range that I showed you on the previous slide and converted it into a frequency, um, it goes all the way down that lower, that left edge is a, a frequency of about inverse year or a period of about a year. So this dark matter is oscillating with a period of about a year. And it's that lowest chunk of frequencies, these very slow frequencies that I want to focus on for the rest of the talk. I mean, there's a lot of different ideas, but I'll, I'll pick one uh, for the rest of the talk. Let me talk about one particular way to go searching for it um, at these lowest frequencies. Now, I, I said we'd also be looking for dark energy. So why, why is that? Why am I talking about that? Well, sort of very quickly, obviously the nature of dark energy is also a mystery. It could just be a constant, but if not, if it has some uh, equation of state different than minus one, if it does change in time, then of course what it would be is a field. That's how we would describe it. Uh, and then I would argue it really looks a lot like this very slowly varying dark matter I was just talking about. It's some scalar field everywhere in the universe. Um, of course, the difference here is that the dark energy is very homogeneous. <laughs> it doesn't clump into galaxies, of course, or anything like that. And it changes very slowly. So if I, if I showed you a movie, like on the last slide, it would be a really boring movie because it's basically a flat constant value ever the, everywhere in the universe. And then that scalar field is slowly decreasing or something with time scale set roughly by the age of the universe, if we're lucky. Uh, so it'd be a very boring movie. Um, uh, but it does mean, though, it's sort of an exciting point. It means that we really can try to do direct detection of dark energy in really a very similar manner to we look for these to, to looking for direct detection of these ultralight uh, dark matter candidates. It's it's really, I would say, very similar to looking for ultralight dark matter. You're looking for this slowly varying background field, okay, which is not screened by anything, goes right through all your shielding and everything, and gets to whatever detector you have, um, uh, and then you can try to look for it. Um, let me maybe skip the, the more motivation, but for myself, I should say the, the cosmological constant problem, which is you may have heard about, is this extreme fine tuning of the value of the, of the CC or the dark energy. Um, for me, I would say, and, and for several people that um, has, has motivated further, the, the idea might be that one potential way to solve it would be to give this dark energy some dynamics and that uh, a signal could be a sort of relic of that would be that it's still changing slowly today. So that would be some motivation for this. I think it's certainly reasonable to consider looking for a time bearing uh, dark energy density. Okay, so I said, all right, the signal of dark matter, dark energy is sort of the same thing. You're looking for this background wave or field that's, that's slowly uh, varying in your experiment and, and goes through any shielding and all that. So how am I gonna look for it? How, what, what effect can we use? Um, generically, any field like this will have several different couplings to us. Um, I'll, by the way, I'll use the word axion for this field, although really, I mean, any light particle at all. In fact, the, the, I'll, I'll talk as if it's a scalar field, but doesn't even have to be a scalar field. Any, any boson, <laughs> any particle that could be dark matter down in this frequency range is just fine. We can look for the same technique. And in particular, one of the generic couplings that it um, should have, doesn't have to have, but, but certainly generically would have, would be uh, this term in the Hamiltonian here. This is a coupling um, of the axion, this A field to nucleons. This uh, G out front, that's just a coupling constant, uh, some, some constant number. 
Uh, it could, of course, be zero. That just means the coupling is not there, and then we'd be unlucky. We couldn't look this way. But there's no particular reason for it to be zero. Uh, it is, however, likely very small. In fact, that's what would make dark matter or dark energy dark. If it was bigger, we would have seen it already. Um, so think just some very small number out front. By the sigma, I mean the spin of a fermion. Actually, I'll use protons. So let's say the spin of a proton. Uh, and then you can see this, uh, uh, this axion couples in through the gradient of the axion field uh, dotted into the spin of the proton. So it actually looks a lot like uh, the coupling of a magnetic field to a proton spin, right? Of course, it's not a real magnetic field. It doesn't deflect charges or anything. And it goes right through all magnetic shielding, uh, which is crucial. Um, uh, but it, is, it acts on a proton the same way. This gradient of the axion field um, is in, in field theory is the spatial momentum of the field, okay, or, or proportional to the velocity of the field. So you can imagine what can I look for then if I have some axion field here, which has some gradient, right? It's some waving dark matter field or something. And if I have some proton that's sitting here in the lab bathed in the dark matter field, then the proton spin will precess um, because of this coupling here. Uh, obviously, it'll only be a very small precession, um, uh, but it will be there and, and we'll get through any shielding and things like that. And it'll be proportional to this axion momentum here. So we call it the axion wind. The, think, of, think of the sort of wind of, of dark matter passing through your experiment, causing um, all protons or all nucleon spins to precess. OK, so that's the effect that I'm going to look for. In fact, are there any questions on that? Um, well, one question is uh, if this G A N N, this coupling constant, is constrained by any theoretical or observational data facts. Yeah, great question. Absolutely, it is. Um, I'll show you a plot actually in a couple slides. So you'll see the constraints, but very roughly, it has to be less than a certain amount, or this um, same coupling would have caused it to be emitted by stars, by things like supernovae, etc. Um, uh, so then that would have cooled stars too quickly, and that's uh, a stringent limit. That, that's the most stringent limit on this coupling. Um, uh, that's, you know, sort of guaranteeing that it's dark enough, <laughs> that it counts as dark, that we wouldn't have seen it. Exactly. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Okay. Now, there's lots of ways to go looking for this effect. Um, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, so have many other people. And uh, uh, by now, there's actually a variety of really high precision uh, lab experiments proposed and even operating to look for it. People use, for example, atomic magnetometers, um, the technology of NMR, uh, these torsion spin polarized torsion balances. Um, these are all, you know, um, uh, excellent and very high precision technology. And these all make really good ways to go looking for this kind of uh, light dark matter. Um, I want to tell you about a, a different way, uh, a new idea we just came out with recently, um, where we think uh, actually storage rings may have a role to play. The storage ring may actually make a really interesting direct detector also for dark matter and dark energy. And I should thank especially my, my collaborators, um, Giannis Semertsidis and his group, um, who are the experimentalists who keep us uh, uh, sane about what you can really do with, these, with this technology. Um, so I, I said this was the effect, right? This coupling of the axion to the nucleon causing spin precession. But you'll notice, you know, sort of um, right away, there's kind of one problem, which is this spatial momentum of the axion. Well, dark matter is cold, right? It's not moving that fast. It's moving at a velocity around 10 to minus 3. I should say, being a theorist, I always set c to 1. So around 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light. Um, and, and our signal will definitely be proportional to that uh, velocity. So I get some large velocity suppression. Um, and you might say, we actually started by thinking about how could you possibly look for dark energy with this? You might say, well, you know, to begin with, I mean, Dark energy, that's not moving at all, right? That's the point, it's stationary. Um, of course, that's only uh, true, or even just approximately true in the cosmic rest frame. The earth, of course, is moving with respect to the cosmic rest frame at about the same velocity of 10 to the minus three. So you would have some signal of uh, a homogeneous dark energy field, or rather in our frame, it's not homogeneous. It does have a gradient. Uh, but there's clearly either way, there's a very big velocity of suppression. We're losing a factor of a thousand, and that's painful. You don't want to you don't want to have to give up a factor of a thousand. And obviously, you don't want to take Adelberger's precision torsion balance and <laughs> try to boost it up to high speed. You can't do that, or some NMR setup. Um, so we sort of said, oh, you know, are, are we sort of screwed there? Is that that's it? That's what you can do with high precision technology. But there is kind of an interesting uh, hybrid between high precision and high energy, which is, of course, we know you can boost individual particles, right, to relativistic speeds. And that's all I really need, just to boost the protons, and then um, later on precisely read out uh, their spin precession, how much their spin is precessed. 
And in particular, this is the proton here and there's its spin and it's, it's got some big velocity there. You can see if I jump to the proton rest frame, uh, it will see some gradient of this axion field. And crucially, keep in mind that it's always in the same direction, of course, as, you, as the proton's velocity, right? As you boosted the proton. Okay, so, <coughs> sorry. Um, that's the basic idea. What are we gonna do? We wanna take some relativistic protons and look for their spin precession in this background axion field. <clears throat> this uh, rate of spin precession is of course just given by this interaction term times time. So you can see I want as much time as possible uh, and I wanna boost to as high a speed as possible. Although there's even a bit of a trade-off. Um, uh, you saw the speed was entering this grad A and speed times time would actually just be distance. So actually maybe it doesn't help me to boost, right? If I, if I just get to higher speed, but have to give up time linearly, uh, if I've got a fixed size of experiment I can make, then what's the point? Um, but uh, um, of course the idea then is to use a storage ring to go in a circle instead of a straight line. But then there's also an immediate problem, which as you can see this uh, velocity keeps circling around and around. So this gradient to the axiom field keeps circling around and around as the proton goes around the ring. And in fact, you still average, the effect average is down to zero and you don't get any help from that. So now enter the sort of um, uh, beautiful work of the experimentalists who um, had already, you know, this was known long ago um, that you could do this, uh, this really fun thing called the frozen spin method. If I have a storage ring and imagine, for example, there's an electric field holding me in it, then when I boost to the protons rest frame, I get a magnetic field and that will cause precession of the proton spin. And if you do it just right, if you arrange it just right, uh, then you can get the proton spin to precess at just exactly the rate it's going around the ring, um, which means its spin always retains the same relation to its velocity as it goes around the ring, and then our effect wouldn't cancel. So then we can add it up. And crucially, this avoids the velocity suppression and improves our signal by a factor of a thousand, okay? Uh, and, and that's why we want to talk about using storage rings to do this experiment. All right. Um, by the way, I should say as an aside, however, although when you boost this grade, you may think, you know, if I actually boost the protons to a high boost factor gamma, this gradient does get the, you know, it's a Lorentz boost. So I get a gamma in the gradients, but I lose the gamma in the time when I go to the protons rest frame because of time dilation. So that's unfortunate. So you don't get the gamma, but you do get the factor of a thousand, which is already pretty good. Um, so here is sort of the, the, uh, the one slide description of the experiment. I won't really go through all the details at all. Um, but the, the, the fun and exciting thing here was um, we realized that what we needed was actually the same as has been proposed for a long time now. There's, a, there's an old proposal, a really beautiful idea to use a proton storage ring as a high precision EDM experiment. And in fact, they project that they could potentially go several orders of magnitude in the proton EDM, the electric dipole moment beyond the current bounds. But it turns out they want the exact same thing. And you can basically kind of understand why if you wanna measure a proton EDM, you want the relation between the electric field and the spin to also always have the same uh, angle between them. <laughs> so they also want to do this frozen spin method. And in fact, it's really the exact same hardware. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, uh, if you were anyway going to build this proton storage ring EDM experiment, it turns out for free, you actually just have to point your proton spin in a different direction for some of the run, and you become a direct dark matter and dark energy detection experiment as well. The crucial thing here is all the backgrounds. I won't go through them. <laughs> But um, uh, the uh, 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 let's say the we're we're leveraging a lot of the really hard work that this uh, collaboration has done over the years to to build up simulation and think very carefully about how to beat all these backgrounds. So I'm skipping actually all the real important point in some sense here. Let me just call out one crucial thing, which is we we want to use uh, counter propagating beams clockwise and counterclockwise uh, and compare them to cancel out a lot of these backgrounds. Okay. Um, but for example, one pretty crucial thing you need to do then is you need to make sure those beams are running along the same beam path to really high precision to 100 nanometers, <laughs> which is which is a pretty impressive way to control your beams. But this uh, these groups have now shown that that should be achievable with these new squid based using squids essentially to read out the position of these beams uh, in situ. Uh, these beam position monitors have been shown to have 10 nanometer per root hertz uh, sensitivity, so it should be more than enough to do what we need. Uh, which is great and very exciting. Um, uh, un unless someone's interested, I'll probably skip all the other crucial backgrounds. Yeah, Peter, Peter just, was just this so... a new, did this have to be a, a purpose-built collider or can you use the... Uh... 
like the LSA or something? It's it's a great question. And for crucial details like that, I, I really, the right person people to ask are the storage ring EDM collaboration. I and mean, they've been thinking a lot about this. You, I think you can, so they would definitely imagine using storage rings that are in existence, but you would need like, there, uh, there are definitely hardware modifications that need to happen. So okay. for example, I mean, for example, you need to measure and control these beams very precisely. And you need to measure and control the magnetic field environment very precisely. So they're, you know, you may be able to use the heart of an existing storage ring, but I think you'd have to like it would be it's it's a highly non-trivial job though to to modify okay. it. I mean, I don't want to make it sound easy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and Peter, just as a warning, we're two minutes past the hour, so uh, yeah. Good. This is this is yeah my my sort of second to last slide here. I just want to show you you get some really good sensitivity. This is the coupling of the axion here that I showed you before versus the mass of the dark matter. And indeed, like I told you, you can cover several orders of magnitude of parameter space and mass and coupling at these lowest masses, all the way down to the, the fuzzy dark matter edge of the space with this technique. And in case you're curious, what's setting that corner frequency there is how much time you put the protons in the ring. Um, that's basically that frequency there, millihertz. Um, let me just kind of quickly skip that and say, as I said, anytime you can look for dark matter, you could also ultra, very low frequency, low mass dark matter, you could also potentially look for dark energy, but this is, I believe the, the most sensitive technique we've come up with so far that anyone has come up with so far to look for this dark matter. And it actually is the first, the only one to just make it to being able to detect some amount of dark energy parameter space. Not a whole lot yet, but I hope this stimulates further thought. Here's a plot again of the coupling versus the equation of state of dark energy. And you can see, of course, when it becomes a cosmological constant, we have no sensitivity. And you just get a little past uh, current bounds from cosmological measurements of the equation of state. Um, uh, but of course, dark energy is much harder to see because locally dark matter has 10 to the five times more energy density than dark energy. Um, uh, so it's a lot easier to see. For, first, you could see dark matter before you, before you could see dark energy probably. All right, so let me wrap up and just say, I, I really think this, this uh, field has shown a lot of promise. There's many, there's a lot of excitement recently, a lot of great ideas coming from a lot of groups, ways to um, combine some of these new experimental techniques uh, with open questions in, in fundamental physics and cosmology. I showed you just a few examples here, but there's a ton others. I mean, I just wrote down a few, but there's even many more. Um, ultra cold molecules, for example, I know Ken has thought about, you could ask him about that. And, and really, I actually think, um, as I said, there's many more new ideas that we haven't even had yet. So I think this is a great time to join the field. <laughs> and I would encourage all of you, especially the younger folks to think about it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for a, a great talk. Uh, and yeah, thanks for, from everyone. Um, so we have, I guess we have time for some questions. So, so please raise your hand in the Zoom reactions and then we'll go in order. Um, well, in the meantime, I, I had a question. Um, so, so, so you related, uh, so, so you're sensitive to dark matter because the because the field oscillates, and mm -hmm. for dark energy, it translates into into W because you're imagining some some scalar field variation mm -hmm. with the change in dark energy. So, so can you can you elaborate a little bit more? Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, no, good question. Exactly. I definitely skipped rapidly over any of that. Um, uh, absolutely, that's right. So. Um, so if it's dark energy that I'm talking about, then imagine this is the dark energy field, okay, whose, whose energy density is, the, is dark energy. Um, then the, uh, oh, actually, sorry, I might even, hold on, I might even have a better slide here. Um, let me see if I can find it, sorry. Here we go, okay, let me share that. This maybe explains a little better. Um, uh, you can see the uh, 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 the dark energy field. Actually, if I talk in terms of four vectors, right, it has some time variation, which is the um, fraction of the dark energy, which is the kinetic energy, which is also exactly as you say, the amount by which the dark energy equation of state is not minus one. It's not an exact cosmological constant, but is in fact changing in time. To change in time, the, the scalar field has to change, of course. So it has to have some some a dot, some time derivative. And uh, that would be this component here, even if I don't assume any spatial gradient at all. Um, and then exactly as you say, all we do is just boost to the protons frame. And I pick up a spatial gradient straight from the kinetic energy of the dark energy field. And so exactly, uh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. 
Exactly. And then, and then exactly it relates to the dark energy equation of state because I need to know how big, we, we call it epsilon here, the fraction of the dark energy, which is actually kinetic energy. And you know, the current limits are like a few percent, maybe, maybe at most 10% of the dark energy density could actually be kinetic energy of the scalar field. The rest has to be uh, potential energy. So this, this epsilon could maybe be up to 10% or so. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, if I just flash that again, there. Um, there, you can see that's about, you know, the dark energy equation of state tells you about what fraction of the, of the dark energy could still be kinetic energy. So we've had a few questions during the talk, but uh, any more now for Peter? From graduate students? All right, if not, let's. Uh, I think well, Massimo. Sorry. 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 Maybe. Massimo? Yeah, if nobody else, and then maybe someone also in contemporary. So uh, for LIGO and for any interferometry detector, it's also important to have many of them just to be sure that you are not uh, fooling yourself. So, how many of your atom interferometers do, do you think we should have? I mean, what is the, the, the grand plan? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so, the absolutely, in some sense, more is, more is better, of course. But one thing that I actually was pretty excited about was that um, actually, in fact, let's see, go up here. Um, I think we get something even just by having um, one, okay? Which is uh, in our frequency band, the sources live a very long time. Uh, uh, they can live months or more, for example, in this mid band. Whereas in LIGO, of course, there are you know, fractions of a second, which means that our detector moves significantly during that time uh, and reorients and everything, uh, whether it's a terrestrial or a satellite-based detector. That's in some ways kind of equivalent to having many detectors. In particular, right, that um, uh, by, by sampling out these different positions and velocities for the detector, it's like I'm seeing, you know, I, it's sort of like I can see the phase advance from this part of when the detector was here to when the detector was over here. And if I do the statistics carefully, you know, I, you convolve that with the waveform, with the, with the uh, binary waveform, you can actually um, pick, pick out a lot of information that you, for example, wanted multiple LIGOs to get. So for example, this is one of the things we showed that with even a single detector, you could get excellent angular resolution on the sky simply because the detector moves and reorients and the sources live a long time. So it's a great question. I would say, in fact, we maybe only need one, especially for a satellite detector, which is nice because those are particularly expensive to build. Um, on the Earth, though, that being said, on the Earth, I think we would like more um, for, for various reasons. But the, um, uh, my hope is that we can build sort of at least two, maybe three of these. Once we demonstrate it at the 100 meter scale, we could build two, maybe three of these kilometer scale detectors. Um, ultimately, that would that would be a hope. I think you'd get a lot of interesting science out of that. Thank you, uh, Peter. Can I ask that question? Uh, so the, the the axion that is a quintessence, uh, but but right. couples with that coupling, uh, because it couples, uh, it will generate mass, right? Mm. That, that's literally proton that you want it to couple to. Uh, yes, yes. Although, which mass? Let me get the coupling out again. It, it is a derivative axion-like coupling. I, I understand that, but fundamentally, you are coupling it to the to a proton, you know, axial current, which, mm -hmm. which tells me that in fundamental theory, that couples to QCD. I don't know how you, you would avoid that. It, good. This coupling can arise from a coupling to QCD, although in the low energy effective theory, it would be uh, different than that coupling. Um, so it doesn't have to arise from the coupling. The coupling in QCD could still be zero and, and you could have this coupling. Um, now, I haven't said how to write down the UV theory that does that. Yes. Um, people have. People have thought about it some and you can play some games. Um, so you're saying there's some game in which it doesn't couple to quarks? Uh, I, I mean, that, that's. I understand you can cancel perhaps coupling to GG dual somehow and still get this but has to couple to quarks somehow because it couples to protons. Right, the gamma five coupling to quarks would, would still not generate a mass. It's still a, it's still a derivative is, operator. Is that possible? It's, it's possible, yes. I mean, I, you know, um, let's say, well, 
I, I don't know what's I don't I don't know what to say is likely, right? Um, uh, but yeah, absolutely. That that derivative coupling of quarks won't generate a mass for the axiom. Yeah, which I think is what you meant. Okay. Then you are safe from my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's a, it's absolutely a fair question. I think anytime you're talking about dark energy, certainly. <laughs> um, I, you, you saw I skipped I rapidly over that. that it would necessarily rule out. It would be your sensitivity to G M G A N M, right? So there will, there will be a tension, you know, mass would be probably square, and then you, you can measure something and probably there will be some window, but you know, that's it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, there's a questions from uh, Kate first, and then Sing Chen. Hi. Yeah, thanks for the great talk, Professor. Um, I was curious about something at the beginning of your talk about um, the gravitational wave looking at the mid-band with these detectors. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a few more words about um, how um, that is more useful for looking at standard sirens. Are, are you able to like probe a different part of parameter space or is just better measurements, more measurements? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Thank you. And, and actually that's something I'm, I'm thinking about right now. So by no, it's definitely not finished. <laughs> so, so plaster a big temporary across everything I'm about to, or, or whatever, what's it, you know, preliminary, sorry, preliminary across everything I'm about to say. Um, the basic idea, though, is that you do get much better angular resolution in the midband. Uh, that can help you identify and pick out uh, sources which have an electromagnetic counterpart. That could be useful for that and, and gives you different sources to access. Um, so that's one interesting set of ideas. But in fact, the one that I'm most interested in right now is um, uh, a really fun idea, not, not due to me at all, but, but from uh, well before me. Um, uh, that I've been working on with uh, Daniel Holtz, among other people. Um, you could potentially even look for only black hole binaries. Uh, so just black hole, black hole, which so f even if they don't have, so far we haven't seen any electromagnetic counterpart to those, right? Um, even if they don't have an electromagnetic counterpart though, you could potentially do the standard siren measurement, which as you may know, the, the way it works is you get the chirp mass. So you get the luminosity distance, I should say, sorry, from the binary waveform. Uh, and then you need a redshift, and then you can do cosmology. And so you would gener gen generally get the redshift from an electromagnetic observation. Um, but the cool idea, um, like I said, not due to me, uh, is that these black hole, black hole binaries, although event by event, you might not be able to get a redshift, you can statistically correlate them with a large scale survey where you have looked at all the mass in that rough area, because from the gravitational wave uh, detection, you get roughly where it is in the sky and roughly how far away it is. Um, and then if you uh, observe many such events, statistically they've shown, that's, that's been shown that you could put them together and actually potentially get some good um, uh, measurements for cosmology. But a limiter though right now is that you can see it matters a lot how many um, known galaxies or clusters are in the box. You get, you get from gravitational wave observation a, a, a box of where your source is, some error bars, if there's too many galaxies in there, forget it. This method doesn't work. It loses sensitivity rapidly. Um, but we have a really good angular resolution. <laughs> so for example, combining that with LIGO's good di distance measurement, luminosity distance measurement, could make an excellent standard siren. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's something I'm excited about right now. Um, but that uh, literally that's, you know, uh, still very preliminary. <laughs> so let me just say could. I don't, I don't know for sure yet that it'll actually work. Um, that's really that's cool, thank something. you. Sengchen. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the axiom and the spin precession. Uh, for the axiom, uh, there is also an experiment in measuring the, the uh, fifth force, like the, the mediated by that axiom. Like, mm -hmm. like, uh, mm -hmm. a, a spin will, will, will move uh, in reacting to a moving mass. So comparing to that kind of experiment and this uh, Precision, a spin precision experiment, which might be harder, like to to make the discovery. That's a great question, and I'd really just say they're different. Um, if you put no here, if you if you put even ignore my curve for a second. Um, so so two things, right? Uh, my curve, of course, assumes it's all of dark matter, whereas those new force experiments you're talking about don't. It doesn't have to be dark matter, or it doesn't have to be a very big fraction of it at all. It'll probably always, if it's in Lagrangian, it'll always be some part of dark matter, but um, you're just looking for a new force between your two, your two um, test objects. Um, so that's just a different assumption, right? So even if it's not dark, if it's not dark matter, I have no sensitivity at all with this experiment, but the new force experiments could still potentially see things. 
Um, but if you put them on the same plot, so, so um, uh, the new force experiments would be kind of up here, roughly, that's their sensitivity. Um, in other words, in this mass range, um, they, the uh, astrophysics bounds are already strong enough that it would rule out the couplings that the new force experiments are currently sensitive to in, in this mass range. Um, uh, so that's, that's roughly where the new force experiments go. Although, so first of all, of course, those may well improve. The astro bounds are unlikely to, to change very much. The new for the experiments can always improve, as we said. Um, uh, and then also people have pointed out that a stellar environment is different than a lab environment. So there could be more complicated models where you would see something in the new force experiments and not in the, in the star. Uh, but if you stick with the simplest model, um, the new force experiments are sort of up here um, on, this, on this plot. Um, did, did that answer the question or was that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any final question? Otherwise, I think we should respect people's time and uh, conclude and thank Peter again. Um, so thanks again, Peter. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.